Hello, uh, good evening and welcome to the Institute of Healthcare Management's latest webinar this evening on the subject of high performance leadership for the 2020s. We are absolutely thrilled to welcome Mark Robb, who is a co-founder and owner of Positive Reframe, who I've known personally for many years now. He's a, a, an absolute expert on the subject and I know that the next 25 minutes, half an hour, is going to bring heaps of really, really interesting and stimulating content for you. Mark's worked with a heap of uh, fantastic retailers and organisations around the world, including Coca-Cola, Specsavers, HCA Health, uh, Clark Shoes, uh, various cruise companies and so on. I'm not going to steal any more of his thunder. I'm simply going to hand on now and ask you to look forward and engage with Mark Robb. Over to you, Mark. John, thanks very much. Well, good evening, everybody. And uh, I, I can't see you, but hopefully you can see me. Um, so the next 20, 25 minutes, we're going to just try and go through some uh, tools, tips, techniques on how to lead, motivate, and engage people effectively. Um, have a, a canter through some of the best research that's around at the moment. And I jo know John's going to leave a little window for Q&A at the end. So if you've got questions, I think there's a facility for you to ask those. I'm going to kick off really by thinking about um, what is it that creates high performance cultures? And probably one of the world's leading authorities in organizational culture is Professor Edgar Schein. And Schein wrote a rather uh, academic and inaccessible book called it Organizational Culture and Leadership. But the punchline is as follows, that Schein says there's 10 things actually that shape the culture of an organization. And you can see there, the top three are concerned with the things that leaders are doing. Um, but all the way through to number four, thinking about how one draws people into a business, moves them through, exits them with good grace um, after time well served because they're not right for the business. Formal and so formal socialization, which looks at um, essentially you know, what you hear at the induction as well as what you hear at the coffee break. And then the systems, policies, procedures, how flat or hierarchical your organization is, even things like design of physical space and how pleasant and environment it is to work. And then stories and myths about people, which you know, may even be people who don't, uh, no longer in the organization, but their ghost looms large in the corridor, as well as the things you bother to sort of codify um, and put on walls. Um, but the big punchline, I guess, is that Shine would say that three of these things have a disproportionately weighty impact on creating culture. In fact, three of them alone do the job of creating 80 to 90% of organizational culture. And maybe as you're looking at those, you can have your own guesses of what they might be. But the punchline is as follows, that actually 80 to 90% of culture is shaped by the top three elements. Um, and what that really means is whatever leaders are measuring, managing, attending to, how they're reacting when it hits the fan and things get real, which reveals the real person, as well as what they model day in, day out, are the things that most heavily shape the culture of an organization. And so when we're talking about leadership, we're talking about the group of individuals that have a disproportionately weighty impact on the tone of the place, the smell of the place, and how people are going to do what they do. And the question, of course, is in a modern, fast-changing business environment, what are some of the key things leaders should be thinking about to maximize the emotional context and you know, connection of their people? Now, a model that I often share with organizations, which I call bounded empowerment, is thinking about how two key elements are being um, balanced off against one another all the time in the organizational setting. And you can see on the, uh, on the horizontal axis, or rather on the vertical axis, we've got clarity. Now, clarity is a continuum all the way from in the dark, no idea what's going on, all the way up to crystal clear precision clarity. And its counterpoint is freedom. People need clarity, but they also need devolved control and autonomy. And sometimes people think that clarity and freedom, if you like, are a dichotomy or two ends of you know, one scale, which they're not. They're actually two separate things. Because classically, when people think about empowering others, they think set your people free, give them voice, allow them to share their ideas. But they think sometimes that means stopping giving clarity. Now, high levels of freedom with low levels of clarity will probably give you anarchy, which would not be something that we would desire, particularly not in the healthcare world. And, um, but that is actually some leaders' experience of empowerment with good intentions. They set their people free and they just got kind of wacky things happening. And people then lose faith and often draw back on the freedom. And when you remove the freedom and the clarity is still a bit lazy, um, hazy, what you can end up with then is apathy, where people think, why bother? Don't really know what I'm trying to do, not allowed to do it my way. The common thing that I see in a lot of organizations day in, day out is actually high levels of clarity. There's goals, guidelines, rules, regulations, policies, procedures, processes, but you're not allowed to deviate very much. Freedom can be constrained. And if you're not careful, it's possible to create a team that are non-intelligently compliant. So people will do the things that they are asked to do, but they may also 
to switch their brains off in the process. Now, clearly the sweet spots where clarity and freedom are both high, which sounds a bit counterintuitive, but is possible. And this is where people get engaged. Emotionally committed, loyal, productive, discretionary effort is the key defining factor of people. Um, and this means actually that um, we need high clarity because anytime clarity is low, we have the risk of apathy or anarchy. But actually in adding freedom to the clarity, we change the type of clarity. In the robots box, clarity tends to be instructional. So do this, then do that, do this, then do that. Rules and regulations, policies and procedures. In the right-hand box, engagement actually changes clarity to outcome focus rather than the how. Um, and so the big shift is not defining all of the steps in the journey, but giving people clarity on the destination. And that allows a little bit of freedom. There is one sort of additional access to add in here, which is capability, which is also a continuum. And so clearly all the way from first day brand new in the job to super capable, super experienced. We're not suggesting that you say to people who are brand new first day on the job, welcome, go for it, that would be a mistake. Um, but we do want to make sure that to devolve control, we have to increase capability. So interestingly, the thing that leaders should be investing in is capability. Um, because you want to have high clarity. In fact, there's never a reason for low clarity. But if our desire is to add freedom and devolve control, the only safe way to do that is to increase capability. So leaders really do need to fix on how they grow the skills, abilities of the people that they lead so that they can safely devolve control. Now, engagement is actually a technical term. And uh, so Gallup would uh, be one of the leading organizations measuring engagement. And they'd say there's three types of people in any organization. So some are indeed engaged, loyal, productive, find their work satisfying. And in fact, people who are engaged give discretionary effort and emotionally committed. Not engaged is the more neutral person who's going through the motions and uh, maybe turning up, doing the job, but not doing that bit more. And then some people are actively disengaged, come to work to make it worse for other people. Don't know if you've met them. They're out there, well poisoners. And so these are our three categories. Now, this is measured by Gallup Worldwide, actually. And um, the current UK stats, and I don't know, again, what you might think in your own mind about what percentage of people, 32 million people working in the UK are emotionally committed, but the sad reality is in the UK, only 11% of people are all in. 68% of people are not engaged, and this leaves a rather disturbing 21% who are actively disengaged. So I suppose what one could say is at best, nine out of 10 people are not engaged, because if only 11% of people are engaged, the remainder are at best neutral. But I mean, another way of looking at this is actually the actively disengaged is nearly double the engaged number, which is clearly an issue. Now, one of the things that makes the big difference, because there, there are some countries where engagement is higher. And in fact, globally, you know, the Americas still are the best. Um, and you'll see Western Europe at 10% doesn't make our 11 look so bad. The Nordics are lead Western Europe, um, but uh, worldwide at 15%, really the bucking, the trend bucking countries are the Americas. And the US currently sits at 33. And in fact, in one of the Pulse surveys just published a couple of weeks ago, the US is currently tracking up to 35. That's still two thirds of the workforce to go after. Now, of course, one of the questions is, when you find organizations where 60, 70% of people are engaged, it is possible, what makes the difference? And Gallup would say the thing that makes the biggest difference to engagement is the immediate line manager. And that's it. 70% uh, of a person's engagement is directly cor correlated to their immediate line manager. So what does that mean? The leader is the weather maker. And uh, whoever you directly line manage, you have the biggest impact on that person's emotional commitment. And when Gallup look at top quartile and bottom quartile, engaged productivity is 17 percent higher and as you can see sales and profit increased dramatically now what might also be more interesting to you is some of the things that fall away so absenteeism falls off 41 percent when people are engaged staff turnover reduces dramatically as does shrinkage which is theft and rework etc but um, you'll see safety incidents and in both employee safety minutes in, um, incidents and patient safety incidents are drawn out specifically in Gallup's research. And so you can have a massive reduction in the negative aspects of organizational life, as well as a big impact on the positives, all correlated to the emotional commitment of people. Now, engagement has another benefit, which is actually in um, affecting people's well-being. Uh, Gallup have these three categories of thriving, struggling, and suffering. And maybe one of the sort of, you know, challenging thoughts for all of us is to look at, you know, broad brushstrokes, half the UK population feel like they're struggling in life, just making it through the day, making ends meet. 
But the key insight is when people are engaged at work, they're three times more likely to feel like they're thriving in life than people who are actively disengaged. So engagement's great for organizations, it's also great for people. It's one of these very few genuine win-wins. Now, of course, the question is, you know, how does one actually sort of uh, impact engagement and how do you actually uh, make this happen? And the research is pretty clear. There are a whole suite of elements that one needs to put in place to drive the emotional commitment of people in the organization. I thought it might be useful just to give you some of the headlines on those key elements. Now, the Corporate Leadership Council did a, a seminal piece of work with 19,000 people across 34 companies and multinational and global as well, trying to establish the drivers of human performance. And the interesting thing was they said there were 106 things that they saw leaders doing day in, day out to try and get people to perform better. But uh, when they studied it, they found nine of these actually drove performance. Six of them made people perform worse and the other 91 was noise well-directed effort and energy that makes no empirically provable difference to anyone's performance. There's so much noise in the system, but there are a small number of things that really help and a small number of things that are destructive. Now, interestingly, the winner is, in terms of the most impactful of all, is fair and accurate informal feedback. And in fact, the Corporate Leadership Council said when you apply a culture of fair and accurate informal feedback where one has been absent previously, you can spike performance up 39%. And then that in itself is a big takeaway. If you were just to go back to work and say, new DNA of my leadership style, I'm going to become a feedback machine, that could make a big difference. But we should look at the, uh, the counterbalance to that. And by the way, fair and accurate informal feedback, the three big correlations there are evidence-based which is the fair and accurate and informal correlates to immediacy and frequency the big idea the more often people get feedback the quicker they can change now if we look at you know the things that are damaging to performance interestingly when you sit down with people to review their performance and the formal review doesn't necessarily mean the appraisal but anytime there's a diarized sit down review of performance when you focus on weaknesses i wonder in your own mind what you think might happen well the answer is destructive and a counterbalance to that is that when we focus on strengths, actually a 36% improvement in performance. Now, I think that's interesting because the Corporate Leadership Council mapped a 63-point delta there on what you could do to a person's performance based singly and solely on whether the dominant message is positive or negative in their formal discussions about their performance. And some of these people talk about giving balanced feedback, which is incorrect. Uh, the research is clear we should give imbalanced feedback towards positives. And of course, what that means is sneaking around every day and catching people doing things right. <coughs> uh, which is, you know, often the opposite of what people experience. Because sometimes leaders see pieces of great performance and think, thank goodness, one less thing to worry about. Let's sort this out. And actually, that's the stuff we should be jumping all over for affirmation. Because repetition of the right behavior is essential. And really, you can only get that when you catch people doing things right and give them feedback on it. Now, if we look at the whole data set, and it's a quick treatment on it, but these, these six killers and uh, nine drivers, what we see in short order is um, ever more appraisals doesn't help. In fact, any type of performance feedback that focuses on weaknesses, so as you can see here, it's informal on personality. If you formalize that, you make things worse. Informal feedback on performance, minus 11, and as I've just said, formal reviews, minus 27. You know, the message is clear, do not go negative. Now, that doesn't mean we cannot correct, but it must not be the emphasis. So the emphasis on weakness is the biggest killer of performance. And actually, chopping and changing the workload is worst of all, because people don't feel they get to finish things, they don't get that sense of satisfaction and completion. That's really two messages, actually. Don't go negative, don't chop and change the workload. Then you can get people to an even keel. But um, if you really want to accelerate exceptional levels of performance, we need to focus on a small number of um, key elements. And as we said, number one is fair and accurate informal feedback. One of the big surprises is that actually the second one is um, trusting people and taking risks. Now, this may, may raise a few uh, red flags for you from a, a sort of a health and medical perspective, but actually experimentation, innovation, trial and error um, is so important to um, generating competitive advantage. And most businesses die due to complacency, not due to risk taking. You could find examples one or two of the banks, but generally the issue is that uh, somebody comes along with a faster, better, quicker, different way of doing it, and you're out of the game. The cautionary tales are all around us. Woolworths, BHS, Blockbuster Video, Maplin, Toys R Us, Kodak, Nokia, you could go on all day. And the exact opposite of a risk taking culture is a blame culture, not a safety culture, a blame culture where people um, try something new, it goes wrong, they're punished, people don't try again. 
And so actually the blame culture is the sort of antithesis of experimentation, idea creation, new sort of faster, better, quicker ways of doing things. We said already that sitting down to formalize strengths-based feedback is a massive performance driver. Um, as is people understand the performance standard against which will be measured. So being clear on what I'm expected to do, to what standard, by when, understanding what good looks like, exceptional looks like, missing the mark looks like, and that I have crystal clear clarity on where those lines are. Internal communication comes up here, and there's a couple of interesting things to mention on this because communication has four different dimensions. Some communication is formal, some is informal, some is conscious, and some is subconscious. So you get combinations all the way from formal and conscious to informal and subconscious. And classically, what people focus on for communication is the formal conscious transmission, where they give the speech, give the briefing, send the email, make the pamphlet, put up the notice board, do the mouse mat. And in fact, the research says 80 to 85% of leadership time, effort, and energy goes into this quadrant as the main mechanism for getting your messages across. Unfortunately, staff pay three to 5% attention to this. Made eight, made eight, we're going down. And so all the energy goes in here, people pay scant attention, it's wallpaper. Of course, when we drop down one level and we're still conscious we're being communicated to, but it's more relaxed. This is where we're having our water cooler moments and chit chats and discussions. And the top right-hand corner of formal subconscious is all the policy procedure process, why people get promoted in the metrics. And those do signal something to people, but clearly the most important is the informal subconscious. And uh, that really is behavior, what you do your style of leadership, what you get juiced and excited about. And uh, the research is clear that leaders only spend five to 7% of their time, effort and energy thinking about and deliberately planning how they'll use their actions as a communication strategy and staff pay 85 to 90% attention to this. So there's a direct and inverse correlation between these two quadrants. Simply put, it doesn't matter what we say unless we do it. Or if we say one thing and do another, people believe our doing. And actually, interestingly, I see too many organizations doing too much in the top left-hand box. You know, here's another announcement, here's another email, here's another briefing, here's another pamphlet. They should do surgery on those things. Get it down to the critical few messages. Tell people they need to hear, but then chat about it till you're sick, fed up saying it, change policies if they get in the way and live with every fiber of your being. And what we should aim to do is four quadrant communication on less messages to get more traction and believability. Now, it's a complex subject in its own right, but that's the, that's the nub of it. And uh, as you can see, done right, that drives performance significantly. Being knowledgeable about what people are working on um, so that we see people in action and uh, have real things to talk about, as well as playing people in position. One of the big things is actually letting people do the work that they were created to do. In fact, if you don't play people in position, you'll probably end up finding it difficult to give them positive feedback. One of the interesting things about you know, doing the things you do best is that um, sometimes organizations talk about making people rounded. The problem with that is people are not created rounded. Best guy in sales, always the worst guy at admin. And uh, so you can send them as many admin training courses as you like, a year from now, still be rubbish at it. You don't teach a pig to sing, it's a waste of time and it annoys the pig. And so what we want to do is play people in position. Now the answer is team, because you can have diversity in a team and together we can become rounded, but you should allow people to be monomaniacs in their own area of expertise. Well, feedback that helps people do their job better, which is different to the top one. This is about interventions in the moment rather than reflecting on things that have happened, little tips and techniques. And then also working for a strong executive team where people feel they can respect the executive group. And these are the nine big drivers the Corporate Leadership Council unpacked. And uh, I guess gives us some big clues on things we should be focused on. But clearly, feedback is a massive part of the recipe and having ongoing, well-constructed, evidence-based conversations that err towards catching people doing things right is an enormous accelerator of people's performance. Now, they're not alone in uncovering some of these key insights, the Corporate Leadership Council. There's a number of studies, and maybe the most famous on this is the work of uh, Gallup in the Q12, based originally on the research of one of their social scientists, Marcus Buckingham, who felt back in the 90s he'd found the recipe and uh, set up a large randomized control trial. Initially, with 105,000 people, uh, Gallup's current global sample group extends to 35 million. It's the largest piece of human performance research that's ever been done in the organizational setting. And uh, they say there's a recipe of 12 elements that need to be in place. If you like the 12 elements of great managing, the 12 elements that actually create a culture for high performance. And uh, they're as follows. 
Now you'll see if you cast an eye through these that they range from the earthy to the quirky. So a question two, I have the materials and equipment I need to do my work right, would seem reasonable. I mean, if you've got to dig a hole and you have no spade, life would be difficult. But then check out number 10, I have a best friend at work. Unusual, but Gallup would say that uh, people who can strongly agree to that question are seven times more likely to be engaged at work. And uh, actually, interestingly, this idea of feeling that there's somebody who's a confidant, who you trust, who you're in real relationship with uh, at work is a strange, but you know, a seemingly massive driver of people's emotional commitment. And actually, some of the timescales mentioned in the Q12 are very important as well, because you'll notice there's four timeframes specified. Question 12 identifies that people think about learning and growth in yearly cycles. They should be able to say at the end of the year, I know things I didn't know a year ago. I can do things I couldn't do a year ago. I'm better than I was a year ago. And that's massively important, as is question 11. A couple of times a year, there's a check-in on where we're going in our career, hopes, dreams, ambitions. But if you see number four and number three, the time frames narrow considerably. And although we've just had a look at the Corporate Leadership Council, seeing how important feedback and praise is, Gallup specify a time window. In the last seven days, I've received recognition or praise for doing good work. Now, what does that mean? That's a binary test question for a leader. So we should be able to, at the end of each week, think, uh, have I given every single one of my direct reports some kind of praise and recognition this week? Yes or no? And the answer should be yes. And uh, I don't know whether that seems like a tough time window or not, but that's the key window. Most people live in the week. And when we think about leading, often we're thinking about the quarterly plan, the three-year goals. And most people live in the week and they need validation and affirmation every week. And question three, they need to play in position every day. Now, that doesn't say every second of every day to the exclusion of anything else ever. But day in, day out, I'm playing in position. Day in, day out, I have an opportunity to use my skills and gifting. And so the Q12 is a recipe of elements that together contribute to a high performance and high engagement workforce. And in fact, it's what Gallup used to measure engagement. And if you wanted to measure engagement, you would give these 12 questions to your teams, ask them to score you on a five point scale anonymously from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And those who strongly agree as a percentage to total, those are the people who are engaged. But what's critically interesting is that um, each of these questions have a causal link correlation to these business outcomes. So done right, uh, profitability, productivity, customer engagement, and staff loyalty will increase. Um, and interestingly, each of the Q12 correlate to at least one of these business outcomes, but there are four powerhouse questions. In fact, there's four of the Q12 that have a disproportionately weighty impact on the business drivers, and they're question one, three, four, and five. And so having you know, this idea of crystal clear clarity of what you're meant to be doing, playing a position daily, praise weekly, and somebody showing care for you as a person. And it's interesting because this correlates to some of the work that Professor Beverly Ali Metcalf did with the Real World Group, which actually originally was based in the medical environment, where she said best leaders they studied, the key thing they did was show genuine concern for their people. Now, that doesn't mean being a big, soft, cuddly teddy bear, but it means, you know, there's something real in the relationship. You're not using people as a number. They're not a pair of hands to do your bidding. And um, so this, although it might seem counterintuitive at first blush when we think about leadership, care and concern for the individual is foundational. And the fact Gallup can prove is one of the biggest two questions of all in the Q12 that correlates the business outcomes. Well, I'm conscious with only a couple of minutes left. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just wrap up with that, a summary thought here, which is that the Q12 actually form a Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so each of the 12 questions are dealing with different aspects of organizational life. So question one and two deal with the basic needs. People have a question when they come to work, what will I get? And the answer is you should get clarity and tools to do the job. But then people's question changes to what am I prepared to give? And the best levers for unlocking individual performance are playing people in position daily, giving them praise weekly, showing care and concern, and investing in their development. If you want teams to play well together, it's built on a foundation of individual performance. And so actually question one to six must be in place solidly before you can get consistently high performing teams. But once you have that, you can get team working, but the levers are different. Now the levers are actually a sense of voice, collective purpose, 
feeling like your colleagues are also committed to quality and friendship. And then the icing on the cake, self-actualization is a feeling that I'm learning, growing, becoming a better version of myself. And so although nothing is completely linear in life, there is a progression uh, through the Q12. And I suppose what you could say in summary, when we think about the, the studies, maybe there are sort of some overarching themes. And with this, we close. Um, I think, first of all, clarity is a foundational theme. Corporate Leadership Council say, I know the performance standard against which I'll be measured, their biggest killer of performances, frequent changes to staff projects, root cause of which is lack of clarity. Gallup say, I know what's expected of me at work, the mission and purpose of my company makes me feel like my work's important. There's a lot in the research about clarity and, you know, we've all heard about the foundational nature and importance of vision when we think about leadership. The second theme, though, I think is strengths. Um, corporate leadership council are, are clear. You get a 29% improvement in performance. Gallup have it in the big four. They specify a time frame every day. But the other reason strengths are so important is they allow you to give praise. Now, look, across the research, praise is a massive theme. A third of the corporate leadership council findings are to do with feedback, and Gallup specify a time frame last seven days. But it will be hard for me to give praise if I'm not playing people in position. So two and three are a couplet. They work together, and in fact. Three is a sort of, you know, you access it through two. Two is the trap door into which you can get into three. And then finally, we have to say care and concern because um, Gallup would say it's one of the two within the big four, within the big 12. And uh, actually, you know, when you look across the, the research and take out the Hollywood uh, from, from leadership, what you find is, you know, care and concern for the individual is the foundation from which you're going to build emotional commitment. So look, we want to do all of the things in the research, but if we want to start or pretend, if I'm creating crystal clear clarity, playing people in position daily, giving them praise weekly, and showing care and concern, that's a really solid foundation for emotional commitment, engagement, and critically, the business benefits that flow from that. We do these four things. So look, I'm conscious that uh, time is gone, and I think that we're, we're going to move to some questions, but I hope that gives... Um, a sort of cogent sort of picture of some of the key themes that we should be focusing on to maximize the emotional connections of our people. Thank you. Well, Mark, I have to say, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here in my office. I've got my ears open. I swear I can hear applause from around the United Kingdom coming through the walls of my office here. That was an uh, absolute box office. Sensational. Thank you. And given that you were on the air for 25 minutes, in fact, just less than 25 minutes, I think anybody who's been listening in this evening, you know, that you've got so many things to take away from there to individually address. How do you improve the performance of both yourself and your teams in the very demanding jobs that you're all doing? So if you'd like to ask some questions, uh, please click on the Q&A function and uh, I will then uh, facilitate the questions and Mark, has been generous enough to spend a little bit more of his time to address those as we go along. Mark, while we just wait for people to type those up, mm. I've got a couple if you don't mind. Yeah, of um, course. I love this idea that most businesses fail due to complacency, mm. not risk taking. And mm. yet, in the, particularly in the healthcare environment, yeah. risk taking is always difficult. And yeah. you know, one only has to look at issues around patient care and whistleblowing and this kind of stuff yeah. to understand how that manifests itself in a very difficult environment in, in, in healthcare. Could you, could you add any kind of a clarity or suggestions sure. to people in terms of how they promote a, a safe environment of risk taking in yeah. the healthcare management environment. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the word itself is a loaded word, and particularly in your world. And so it may not be the right word to use when you're uh, speaking to your people. It's the word the Corporate Leadership Council used because they say it, it, it's, the f it's the foundation from which the fruit of innovation and creativity grows. Now, that said, I'm not against policy procedure process. Um, policy procedure process should be a foundational minimum standard that you cannot fall below, but you're free to innovate and improve on top. And that's the key thing. So we don't want somebody saying, you know, hey, we're just going to mess with the meds today and see what happens. No, there's, there's some foundational minimum standard stuff, but people have got to understand culturally, we're looking to that as a base to improve on, not as a straight jacket to bind. And, uh, you know, I think one of the challenges is if you're so risk averse, it can lead to covering things up. It can lead to dishonesty. Um, and I know that there can be issues in your world with that as well. And so I think 
what we're trying to do is let people see we are innovating on top of a solid foundation of established policy, but that is not a straitjacket that binds us. I don't know if that helps, Sean. Thank you. No, that's uh, perfectly answered. <coughs> Excuse me, good gracious me. Um, just while the rest of you uh, consider any further questions, I've got one more for you, if you'd be generous enough to answer, Mark. <coughs> you talked about 58% fewer patient safety incidents in, organization, in organizations where there is an engaged uh, workforce. Yeah. And you, you pulled that deliberately, I suspect, out of the Corporate Leadership Council research. I'm just wondering where you talk about clarity and strengths and praise and concern for boosting engagement. Yeah. How might an individual manager figure out for themselves how well they're, they're doing that or not doing that? Um, you use the Gallup 12 as an example. Is that something that an individual could, could actually use productively in their own environment? Yeah. I mean, the, the Q12 is, is the sort of way of measuring it. Um, and so what you would do is you would give that to your people anonymously to answer those questions. And then you're, in a sense, you're going to know. Um, so if you find 10% of your people strongly agree to get praised in the last seven days, you know, you know, you've got work to do. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the way to do it. Of course, one of the challenges with that is you can only do that periodically, maybe once or twice a year. Um, but I mean, some of, those, some of those questions, for example, that question for have I given praise in the last seven days, you don't need to ask anybody, you know yourself whether you have uh, given yeah, yeah. praise. So some are more binary like that. Others in terms of I know what's expected of me at work, probably checking in with your people. The best way to check whether people have clarity um, is, is to sort of, uh, is to ask them. And I, I don't mean, do you have clarity, but to say, could you summarize back to me what you think I expect of you? And then see how well people can articulate it and you can find some place, uh, you know, between what you think they know and what they think is your um, desire. So yes, yeah, a bit of appreciative inquiry there helps too. Terrific. And I, I actually you. think just, Sorry, go on, Mark. Sorry, just as a, a quick aside on that, one of the things that I often say to organisations is to is to ask sort of awkward questions to your people. So things like, what are the things that are getting in the way? What are the things that I ask you to do that if you were me, you wouldn't ask me to do? <laughs> you know, what are the daftest things you've had to do in the last week? What are some of the workarounds you're doing? Because I think what those questions do is they, they get under the skin of real life issues rather than is everything okay? Um, and also because you're asking for people to tell you something that could be improved, you've got more chance of getting a conversation going, I think. Terrific. And very welcome advice. Thank you. Right. I've got a couple of questions have come in. Sure. So the first one is from Jane. Hello, Jane. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week when I visit. Uh, Jane asks, hi, Mark. I spend a great deal of time talking to and praising our staff. But some of our partners, she's, she's a, in a GP practice, oh. feel that this is too fluffy bunny and mm. they do not appreciate the benefit. Any tips on how to persuade them? They yeah. are a tough bunch. Okay, good real life question. So number one, show them the research. Show them the research. I don't know whether you were screenshotting some of my slides or anything, but you know, look, Corporate Leadership Council, 19,000 people, 34 companies. You give formal reviews, you focus on strengths, 36% improvement in performance. You know, Gallup, 35 million people sample group globally. One of the most important things, praise in the last seven days. So you can show people the research. I find that often helps actually take away the fluffiness. The other thing I think is to, for people to understand what praise actually looks like. So what I don't want to say to somebody is, you know, hey, great job in the report writing. The last four reports were great, which is a bit fluffy. I want to say to somebody, hey, great job in the report writing. What was really good? The last four reports were excellent. What was really good? Three of them were two days early. And the reason that was helpful, I had some extra time to consider your findings before I presented them to my boss. Love the recommendations page. Give me a real head start on what to do first. You know, you added in that research, invaluable. Give us a much broader overview of the whole market. Positions a brilliant piece of work. So you make people believe it with specificity, impact, and consequences. And I think that really takes it away from the, you know, hey, great job, attaboy, to something really, you know, detailed. Because then people know what to repeat as well. Um, and I think that makes it harder and crunchier. Super. Uh, Jane, I hope that's helpful. Um, I'm perfectly happy to send you some links to some of that research as well. So I, I hope that's useful. 
Um, we have a, a, another question has come in, Mark, uh, and I need to preface this for your benefit. Um, we uh, many, well, all healthcare facilities in the UK are regularly inspected. In England, that's by the Care Quality Commission, yep. uh, who have a reputation for, uh, well, it can be a little bit tough to be on the receiving end of those inspections. Yep. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm aware of that, yeah. Uh, this individual asks, given that our inspection regime is not aimed at being positive, how do we handle poor inspections when in some cases factors outside our control influence these? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that is a tough question. And, and I know actually from some of our clients and, you know, the private sector, you know, those CQCs can, you know, can either be hugely uplifting for your team or a real a real kick i mean i think the, the point is that there's a number of things actually that will always be outside of your control and i often think leaders are trying to provide a bit of an umbrella of protection from their people now if there are genuinely issues you know if a cpc reveals that we've got to be honest about that too so this emphasis on strength is not saying we avoid difficult conversations at all and that we not that we can't correct we can the, the feedback should be imbalanced towards positives but there's going to be times where we're going to have to do correction and in fact if we avoid those difficult conversations what you tolerate you teach it's not neutral um, and so I don't want to be avoiding things and saying everything's great and then, you know, get crushed when the, when the CQC tell me that, that I was wrong. Um, but at the same time, you know, if, if there's tough feedback to give people, I think we can provide a bit of a, an umbrella of protection for them as leaders as well. I mean, there will be things that will be in and out of your control. And actually, you know, you might find, never mind the CQC, you know, your boss or one of your colleagues, James, question is a, a tricky character. You know, we all know what that's like. What we can do is something in our own area and you know it's best to control the controllables you know as gandhi said everyone wants the world to change no one thinks of beginning with themselves you must become the change you want to see in the world today and so i think we do what we can with our people and we do our best to influence and persuade the larger world but you know we take control of what we can do with our people that's the thing that can make the biggest difference day in day out very helpful mark thank you well look, i'm going to bring this to a close now um, Mark's contact details are up on the uh, screen right now. If you would like to contact him directly, I know he'd uh, be delighted to receive your comments, uh, invitations, whatever else it may be. And I know from personal experience, he always replies very promptly. Uh, all that remains for me to do is to remind you that the next uh, uh, Institute of Healthcare Management webinar is on the 12th uh, of March, uh, and we look forward to welcoming you along to that one. Finally, um, I've got to say, Mark, once again, thank you so much. That was an absolute masterclass. My pleasure. And, uh, we'd love to get you involved around the country, perhaps in doing some physical uh, examples of, of your, uh, your teaching as well. That would be fantastic. Yeah, love to. I should have finally added that on the 12th of March, the webinar is with David Newton, and he's focusing on business ethics. So don't miss out. Please register for that as soon as possible. Okay, that's it from us. Thank you so much once again for tuning in to the Institute of Healthcare Management. We much appreciate your involvement and your engagement with us. I wish you a fantastic week and uh, speak soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.